Our reading today is an excerpt from the May 3rd, 2013 article in the New York Times by Tara Parker Pope titled, Suicide Rates Rise Sharply in the U.S. Suicide rates among middle-aged Americans have risen sharply in the past decade prompting concern that a generation of baby boomers who have faced years of economic worry may be particularly vulnerable to self-inflicted harm. More people now die of suicide than in car accidents, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which published the findings in Friday's issue of its Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. In 2010, there were 33,687 deaths from motor vehicle crashes and 38,364 suicides. It's vastly underreported, said Julie Phillips, an associate professor of sociology at Rutgers University, who has published research on rising suicide rates. We know we're not counting all the suicides. It is the baby boomer group where we see the highest rates of suicide, said the CDC's Deputy Director, Ilianus Arias. There may be something about the group and how they think about life issues and their life choices that may make a difference. Preliminary research at Rutgers suggests that the risk for suicide is unlikely to abate for future generations, unfortunately. Changes in marriage, social isolation, and family roles mean many of the pressures faced by baby boomers will continue in the next generation Dr. Phillips said. Nancy Berliner, a Boston historian, lost her 58-year-old husband to suicide nearly two years ago. She said that while the reasons for a suicide were complex, she would like to see more attention paid to prevention and support for family members who lose someone to suicide. One suicide can inspire other people, unfortunately, to view suicide as an option, Ms. Berliner said. It's important that society becomes more comfortable with discussing it. Then the people left behind will not have this stigma. On April 19th, 2011, two, two days after her 51st birthday, our beloved daughter-in-law, Begonia Solana Elorza, the wife of our son Steve, took her own life. My wife, Marnie, and I had taken Steve's and Bago's three sons, David, Daniel, and Andrew, to Martha's Vineyard for a brief vacation, including our daughter, Kathy, and her two sons, Michael and Nicholas. The horrific news of Bago's death came in a telephone call from Steve on the night of the 19th, during which we decided we could not immediately tell the boys But instead, we invented a story for why we had suddenly to take the boys home so that their father could tell them in person that they had lost their mother to suicide. During the intervening days, then months, now years, I've written a series of poems which I will share with you today. These are poems of loss, the first of which, There Are No Words, was written during the two days following Bago's death. There are no words. There is only the word. Unspeakable, but it heard again and again. There are only waves. The first, a tsunami. And then the aftershocks. The visible images, wave after wave, like torrents of tears. There is no logic, no explanation, only the fervent wish that the nightmare will end and we will all awaken to the mundane busyness of living, of life, of resurrection, or just maybe, please God, the reversal of the arrow of time. An integral aspect of loss is the grieving process, which is ubiquitous, always present. And an integral part of grieving is guilt. 
at least for all of us in my family, especially my son. Why didn't we see this coming? Why didn't we do something to stop it? The poems I'm reading today are mainly presented in chron chronological order of their writing after the event, and so represent a chronicle or historical record of the events and feelings in the order of time. The following poem, The Grieving, was written about a month after Bago's death. The Grieving. The image flashes like lightning before my eyes. Now, as always, past and future, as long as I can remember or foretell, lancinating like a phantom limb or the cold sweat of angina. It is always with us, unremitting, like background noise or the white glow that shines into what otherwise might be sleep. May you, may we, place the ashes of your guilt and the ashes of our guilt into a porcelain urn and cast them with the ashes of your grief and the ashes of our grief on the still waters of healing. During the months preceding Bego's death, I had been reading and writing poems about cosmology and quantum mechanics, some of which I read from this pulpit two years ago in a service entitled The New Cosmology. There's something quite disorienting about suicide, and physics was immediately displaced in my mind by grieving. There is something uniquely stigmatic and unspeakable about suicide which makes honest discussion especially difficult. In fact, one of the major reasons I have chosen to read these poems today is to facilitate an honest and direct discussion of suicide and thereby to ameliorate some of the stigma associated with it. As enunciated by Nancy Berliner in our reading today, one suicide can inspire other people, unfortunately, to view suicide as an option. It's important that society becomes more comfortable with discussing it. Then the people left behind will not have this stigma. During the reception at the funeral home preceding the cremation and funeral service, the members of the family of the immediate family were given an opportunity to view the body of Begonia. As a Unitarian, I had a great deal of ambivalence about viewings, which was shared by other family members. However, my ambivalence was immediately dissipated when our three grandsons led the way, first the youngest, Andrew, then 10 years old, then Daniel, 13. Then David, 15. This poem is entitled, The Unspeakable Word. The fabric that was space-time has lost the weft of time. My mind has been fixed on the inner space and the outer space, on the vastness of the cosmos and the quantum world of quarks until our lives were changed forever by the sudden awful collapse of the universe into the singularity that is death. And then the three boys lead their father and the rest of us to the open casket to kiss goodbye their beloved mother who has now become ashes as all of us will be.
Come from where the mountain soars The veil is dim The ocean roars The ocean roars passes the poignancy of grieving and the guilt, the guilt surrounding it, slowly and gradually gives way to remembrance and other emotions. The following poem, The Turning Point, recounts a dream I had about six months after Bago died. The Turning Point. I awake dreaming of a carved oak staircase a man standing on the landing is hanging himself, draped in a prayer shawl, his friend comforting him with whispered words of forgiveness. And now I remind myself that we have turned the corner and come face to face with a jokester in a clown suit who reminds us that life must go on, at least until it doesn't anymore.
During Thanksgiving 2011, Marnie and I had a family gathering at the house with a service of remembrance for Begonia, led by a close friend of Steve and the rest of us, a Presbyterian minister, the Reverend Graham Robinson. Graham asked me to write a poem for the occasion. It is entitled, We Give Thanks. Since last the crocuses bloomed for the passage and healing of time, we give thanks. Since last we were led to the casket for the courage and love of three sons, we give thanks. Since last we turned over the earth for the fa falling of summertime rain, we give thanks. Since last we heard singing of birds for the Father's resilience and strength, we give thanks. Since last the ashes were scattered for the tears of the fathers and sons, we give thanks. Since last turned the foliage of autumn for the bonds of our conjoined families, we give thanks. Since last, we have thirsted for meaning, for the healing power of water, we give thanks. Since last, we have fallen in darkness, for the warmth and the light of candles, we give thanks. Added to the poignancy of our pain of losing Begonia was her method of suicide. She hanged herself using a silk scarf. We will never know why she did this unspeakable thing, but we do know that people who attempt or succeed in committing suicide do this under the completely false delusion that the survivors will be better off without them. My family and I can attest to the absurdity of this delusion and bear witness to the suffering resulting from her suicide. It has been said by a suicide researcher, Thomas Joyner, that, quote, suicide does not end pain. It transfers it to the broken shoulders of the family and friends. Also, Susan Rogers, the consumer advocate for the Mental Health Association of Pennsylvania, who attempted suicide but survived, characterizes suicide as, quote, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Bega was a prolific reader, a highly successful court interpreter, and a devoted mother, and nothing in her past history suggested the possibility that she would take her own life in this way. The following poem is entitled, Spinning Silk. Spinning Silk. The crocuses and daffodils came up early this year, too late, alas, for you to see. So many books you read so perfectly arranged on so many shelves as they were last spring arranged in your mind. It has been nearly a year now, and something's missing now from these shelved books, as if someone had pressed delete in error. Where do our memories go when we die? Spiders pass the memory of spinning silk from generation to generation, and pass to you the secret of a fabric that unlike cotton does not tear when wrapped around something like a neck. This church is a welcoming and generous place where everyone knows they are accepted and loved. We now have the opportunity to practice the spiritual act of generosity by supporting our church, or we'll receive the offering for the ongoing work of this congregation and community.
the shaking of the voice that meant to sing the sound of a strong voice breaking. Following the funeral, Bego's body was cremated and some of her ashes were buried in the cemetery plot in West Hartford and the remainder were scattered on the waters of a lake in Spain where her father's ashes were scattered. However, there are other remains besides the ashes which form the substance of memories. These memories in part ameliorate and in part exacerbate the grieving process. We remember her with fondness and as time goes by, the pleasant memories tend to lessen grief, but also occasionally add to the pain of loss. The following poem is entitled, Remains. Dear departed soul, who art in scattered ashes over the waters and on the earth, teach us the language of the dead as you have taught us the language of grief. Tell us how to exorcise your ghost, but go not away before you whisper into our sleeping senses the sights, sounds, smells, of the land wherein you dwell. You still have the scent of your clothing still hanging in your closet, the stylish fashion of your raiment, the timbre of your voice. These are the remains that sometimes force us to turn your photographs to face the wall. The next poem I shall read is entitled The Grieving Two. It is addressed to my son Steve and includes reference to my friend Joseph who never resolved the suffering he experienced due to the death of his son who was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany at the end of the Second World War. 
the grieving too. I awake suddenly in the closed eye of night, falling as the spider spins its web that falls across my face like the memory of your late night telephone call and my friend Joseph, who survived the Holocaust only to lose his only begotten son, as we have lost your only begotten wife. My friend David told me that Freud said he could cure his patients of such a loss until he lost his own daughter. It only needs to be gathered up like ashes in an urn and kept in some sacred place for a lifetime. The next poem is also addressed to my son, Steve. The Long View. It has been nearly two years now, and still your closet is full of her clothes, as if she might come back any day now. And still, we are all careening headlong into oblivion, like the long view in autumn, through the middle distance of the Saturnine trees, which, like the dead, do not know how much we miss them. As I've said, I'm interested in cosmology and quantum mechanics and their religious implications. I'm also an agnostic and as such have no formal belief in an, in a, in a, an afterlife or consciousness after death. However, it is true that every molecule of our bodies is derived from matter, including stars in the universe and that after death, admittedly on a very long time scale, every molecule of our bodies will return to cosmic matter. So in a sense, this lends credence to the phrase ashes to ashes and dust to dust. This poem is entitled Good News from the Universe. I hear the prisoner tapping out his coded poems on his cell wall as I hear the gospel from deep space that all that unseen dark matter in the universe may be accounted for by a particle called the neutralino. And although we do not yet know what particle accounts for dark energy, we may be getting close to knowing that Einstein's cosmological constant is a Goldilocks number that may save us all from ending up in a deep freeze or a big crunch, at least until tomorrow or the day after. In the meantime, O oh best beloved, it is good news that since we are all made up of the dust of stars, you will, in your own good time, tell us why nearly two years gone, you took your own good life away from us and gave it back to the dust of stars where we will meet again sometime in the end of days. The, the postlude is based on a 19th century Protestant hymn, probably from the Appalachian region. It was, um, it was arranged by Mac Wilberg, the music director of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And the words that we are going to sing were written to this tune by our own Peter Walsh. And his, poet, his poem is a testimony to, in the midst of grief, how the human spirit continues on. We are also joined in, in the postlude by John Dewey, who will be playing the drone and a, and a, and a, and a little solo on, on the bass viol. <clears throat>
Oh. 